believe it's it's enough that you can you can right. announce. No, I think it's just oh, to okay. I, I so like to be a joint trust. Bryce is in the process of putting together what will actually be another meeting. We're going to call it the same group, but it's basically going to be a meeting in the East Bay. So for people for whom that's more convenient, um, we'll probably have a monthly meeting uh, at Berkeley Labs. Yeah. Probably on site at Berkeley Labs for people for whom that's an easier. We've got a pretty great view. And so um, uh, Arthur O'Dwyer is doing a meeting in San Francisco once a month. And so we're kind of becoming this nebulous geographically <laughs> convenient for people who are there. <laughs> yeah. right? Okay, so um, my name is John Cal. I'm going to be talking tonight about. Uh, C++ Today, which is the name of the book that I wrote with my uh, co-author, Gaspar Asman, who's not here tonight. Um, so, um, this book is actually available free. You can, um, you can get this by just sending your email address either to um, JetBrains or to O'Reilly and they will send you the electronic version free. I do have um, a few printed copies here tonight that they sent me, and I'll be giving those away afterwards if you guys uh, want them. Um, but my question is, why would they, why would these companies, why would O'Reilly, O'Reilly's in the business of printing books and selling them for money. That's kind of what O'Reilly does. Why would they make a book and give it away free? What's the reason? Why would they do that? It turns out my book's not the only one they do this. They have a whole bunch of books. They call them reports. You'll see it's calling it a book is a bit of an exaggeration. It's mostly a booklet. Um, but why would they do this? What's what's why would they do this? Yeah. Sell more of the other books. That's exactly right. When O'Reilly identifies a technology that they think is hot. It's an up-and-coming technology, something brand new, and it's going to be exciting, and they know they're going to be writing books about it and selling books about it. They want to get a bunch of email addresses so that they can market this and find out, you know, take the temperature of this um, new technology. So C++, is this a hot new technology? <laughs> Which part? <laughs> Which part? Um, actually, that is kind of the whole point, is this is why I'm talking about this, is that suddenly C++ is a hot new technology. Now, a hot new technology that's very, very old is a very strange thing. But we're going to talk about this weird um, uh, contradiction, right? So we're going to talk about C++ as a programming language. And so I want to go back to the beginning, and I mean the very, very beginning. Who can identify, who knows what this is? What's that? It's reconstruction of Babbage's. Engine. It's Babbage's yeah, analytical engine. And it's a difference. The, this is the difference engine, right? They didn't make the analytical engine is a difference engine. So you see him peeking out there, right? They have a portrait. Whoever took this photograph, which I didn't take, uh, did an excellent job. They got Babbage poking out, right? Um, so this is one of the really early, early computers. Really, really early computers. Um, this, uh, all these, you know, knobs and switches that you see there, uh, those gears, are actually the data, right? They're representing the data that, that, that is in the computer at any given time. The program itself is actually part of the machine. And for very early computers, that's what you had. You had the computer, the program was actually part of the computer. Um, but uh, this fellow named John Van Neumann made the observation, he said, you know, computers store data, Programs on the, how to operate on data are, those are a set of instructions, and sets of instructions are just data. So a computer should be able to store the information that it is executing. The, 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 the program should be part of the computer's data. And we honor him by referring to it a, a Van Neumann machine. Um, because now that's basically all Van Neumann, all machines are Van Neumann machines. We, we, we expect the computer, part of its data is the program that it runs. Now, when the computer has data in it, what is that data? Well, it's always numbers. In, in most computers, it's binary, right? It's ones and zeros, it's a whole bunch of ones and zeros. So even if the data is a color or a cat video, it 
doesn't matter. It's all really ones and zeros. And so the same thing is true for instructions, computer instructions. But it's not very useful for programmers to remember computer instructions as a whole bunch of numbers. So instead, uh, we use this. Who can identify what this is? This is, uh, this is actually um, 6502. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, yeah, it's assembly lines, right? And so we have what we call these mnemonics, these instructions that we make up that actually represent the, the numeric instructions that are the machine language, right? And this works pretty well. And it, it has this weird thing that we call this assembly language. And we always say it assembly language, like there is such a thing as assembly language. And in truth, that's kind of a, a misnomer because there's, an, there's a different assembly language for every architecture of the machine. You have to understand the architecture of the machine to understand what the assembly language is because it's all a different set of instructions depends on what the machine runs. Right? Um, and so we, but we can program in assembly language. And in fact, if you are a computing professional, that's what's expected of you, right? At least in the early days, that's what was expected. The idea was that you wouldn't want to be uh, limited by anything that the machine could do. In assembly language, you can make the machine do anything. And you have the greatest possible potential for performance because there's no getting between you and the instructions to the machine. But what if you're not this computing professional? What if you are a domain expert? Suppose you're a businessman, right? So you want to write business software. You want to write tax accounting or oil and gas accounting or something like that. Do you want to write that in assembly language? You're not considered a computing professional, although I'm saying that with sarcasm, because clearly if you're writing oil and gas accounting on a program, you are a computing professional. But if you're not a computing professional, then you don't need the full power of the machine and you aren't expected to write code of that performance. Instead, we give you something else. We give you COBOL, right? Grace Hopper invented COBOL so that business people could write programming languages. But what if you're a scientist? Bryce works with a bunch of scientists, right? They, uh, do they have a bunch of glass tubes and stuff? Somewhere. Some have glass tubes. So what do scientists need? Well, scientists need uh, something from John Backus. He created Fortran, which is a language specifically for science. So I'm kind of exaggerating in saying that there's, uh, in the early days, there were two ways of working the world, you were either in the business world or you were in the science world. But that was, uh, uh, to some extent, this was true. Anybody recognize what this is? What's that? No? Maybe somebody said it and I didn't hear it. Mainframe console? Well, yeah. It's a, it's a unibank. This, this is the user console to the unit. Right? So the UNIVAC was uh, released in 1951, and it was a business and government application. Right? So it knew how to do things like BCD. Who can tell me what BCD is? Oh, binary, code <laughs> binary code decimal. Right? Now, today, we would laugh at that. Literally, we laugh at that. Right? But at the time, it was considered, well, you know, if you have a business computer, you've got to be able to do binary, uh, binary code decimal. Uh, it could also handle some text processing. Um, who, can, who can tell me what this guy is? It's not quite as well known as the unit. Um, this was called the LINK, or the Laboratory Instruction Computer. It was sold by DEC as the LINK 8. And it supported, it was mostly sold to um, laboratories. And so what is it, it was sold as a scientific machine. What does that mean? What, is, what would it have to support for scientific machine? Is that BCD? No, floating point. No, it had floating point. Okay, so this gets us up to the 1960s. Something very important happened in the 1960s. In 1964, IBM did something that cemented its lead. It was already kind of the hardware lead, but it, it released something that just made it the dominant player in the computing world. It released the uh, System 360. This is the IBM System 360. And when I first heard of the IBM 360, I thought 360 was just some marketing you know, made up number. I used to work for Boeing. Did anybody know what the 707 stands for? The first, the first jetliner was the Boeing 707. You know what the 707 stands for? What? Square root two by two. Square root two by two. Square root two by two. Yeah. 707 just sounded cool. <laughs> 707 just sounded cool. 
But, and so I assume the same thing with the 360, because I worked in Boeing, I just thought that's the way people go. But the 360 actually stood for something. Who can tell me what the 360 stood for? Anybody know? The degrees around? That's right, that's exactly right. It meant um, degrees around. In fact, according to IBM's marketing at the time, it says, now one computer with all of your data processing needs. And by all of your data processing needs, it means both business and science. All, right? Um, so the, the 360 was designed, um, uh, it, it featured binary, uh, also decimal, also BCD, hexadecimal floating point calculations. It was the first instruction set that was implemented in microcode. It was a very extensive micro, uh, instruction set because it actually did combine all of what you might expect of a business machine and all of what you might expect of a scientific machine. And so it had a fairly large instruction set. It also did something else, which to us today is kind of a no-brainer, but it wasn't quite so obvious back then. And that was 8-bit byte addressing. So in certain early hardware, rather than be able to have the address lines uh, identify every individual byte or every individual character, you would have the address line identify a word, where a word could be 36 bits, or maybe 16 bits, or maybe 20 bits, or some arbitrary number. And if you needed to access a particular character within that word, you might actually have an instruction set that says, oh, I want to access the third byte in the word at this address. And that sounds very baroque for us. It's, you know, what a terrible way to address characters. And Turns out that's probably true. But the reasoning at the time was that you saved address lines, right? You, your hardware could be less expensive because you didn't need as many address lines in order to address as much memory. But IBM, I don't think they were necessarily the first computer to use this approach, but they were so successful that they actually created what we would call the C machine architecture. The idea that every character has its own address. And they did it 10 years before C. So let's talk about C. Let's talk about the 1970s now. Um, this is Bell Labs. Bell Labs had three important ingredients necessary for the creation of Unix. One is that it has researchers like Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, uh, very bright guys who were sitting around trying to do interesting stuff. They also had a need for a document processing system. So you have to understand that at this time, if you wanted to make professional looking documents, you hired a typesetter to work on a machine called a typesetter. <coughs> and that was very expensive. And the patent office at AT&T, I don't mean the US patent office, I mean the people at AT&T that were responsible for AT&T's patents wanted to have a document processing system. And they had one other important thing, and that was they had this PDP-7, not this particular one, but one that looked like this that was just kind of sitting in the corner doing nothing. So Ken Thompson started working on it, and he wanted to prove that Unix was a viable system, and then he got it up and going, and then he went to the, the, uh, uh, the patent office and said, if you will buy me a PDP-11, I will write a document processing system using my operating system. So um, how many of you have heard of NROF text format? All right, so this is where it came from. That was really the reason that Unix was created, was to create him. Um, so what was Unix written in? What was this operating system written in? What language was it written? Originally? BCPO. PDP-11 assembly. C? No, I think it was PDP-11 70. I saw an assembly language version. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. Um, the, uh, the confusion comes from the fact that, yes, Unix, as every operating system at the time, was written in assembly. However, Unix system, I believe, 4 needed to be ported. And they realized that it would actually make more sense to rewrite Unix in C and port it that way than to try to rewrite it in assembly language in every language, in every uh, operating system, every architecture. So, um, so this is what drove the adoption of C. And C turns out to have flipped 
certain thinking on its head. Because the idea, as I said before, was that high-level languages were for domain experts, not computing professionals, right? So if you knew a lot about science and you wanted to do um, formulas, then you used Fortran. If you knew a lot about tax law and you wanted to write accounting software, then you used COBOL. But if you were a computing person, then why would you want a high-level language? Well, it turns out, if you're a computing person, you want a high-level language for the same reason everybody else does, which is that you want to be hidden from the arcanity of the machine, except when you really need it. And you want somebody else to worry about those kinds of performance things. So let the compiler writer know the machine really, really well, and you write in a high-level language, right? So that's where, uh, that's why C was adopted as the uh, systems programming language. It, uh, um, it has become very, very successful because it does, in fact, allow for some high-level abstraction, certainly higher than assembly language, but at the same time allows you access to the machine when you want it, but doesn't actually make you have to be an expert about the machine you program. So uh, C caught on very, very much. Uh, the problem with C, or a problem with C, I'm sure there's lots of people who have opinions about the problem with C. <laughs> this is also opinion that I'm about to state. And that is that at a certain level of, a certain size of your code base, and some people have said about 50,000 lines of code, and nobody can prove it, but nobody can disprove it, right? You start to realize that the abstractions in the C language are not high enough level. There's some medium level abstractions that are certainly higher than what you can get from assembly language, and they allow you to write at a higher level abstraction in assembly language, but don't really support really high level abstractions. So that's where we get to the 1980s, and a guy named Johnny Struestrup who was working at Bell Labs. But now that I've gotten us to the 80s, now I'm going to take a big step back in time, and I'm going to talk about these two guys. Who are these two guys? You guys can read it. Okay. So who are Dahl and Nugget? They won a Turing Award. They won a Turing Award for Simula, but more importantly, ideas fundamental to the emergence of object-oriented programming. So particularly, um, Kristen Dahl happened to be a professor at this little tiny town in Denmark, which happened to be where Bjarne Struestrup grew up and then went to grad school. And so he was an instructor, and he explained to him about object-oriented programming and simulation. And, and Bjarne had an idea about how to write high-level simulations. So Bjarne then goes on to get his PhD at uh, Churchill College in uh, Cambridge. And he, as part of his PhD thesis, he wanted to simulate uh, a high-level system, and so he wrote this in, what did he know? He knew simulation. So he wrote this high-level simulation, and he ran it on the Cambridge computer until the admins unplugged the computer because, of course, it brought the computer to its knees, and he didn't get any useful information. So something that happened that is so important that I'm going to kind of violate a rule of presentations, and I'm going to actually read you a couple of screenfuls of text. But I'm doing this because I think this is really an important point. So, Bjarne said, so I rewrote my simulator from Simula into BCPL. BCPL was this um, ancestor of C. And all of the high-level structures disappeared. All of the nice organization that helped me debug and helped me design disappeared. But the resulting BCPL, once I had debugged it and lost half my hair in the process, <laughs> ran really fast. It could use all the resources of the machine. It could communicate with anything on the machine. And I got my data, and I got my PhD. I came away with the opinion that I would never again attack a problem with tools that were fundamentally unsuitable. And in particular, I didn't want to make the choice between elegant, which Simula was for this problem, and efficient, which BCPL was. I want both. And that has been sort of one of my guiding lights. If you give people the choice of writing code, writing good code or fast code, there's something wrong. Good code should be fast. So with this background, when Bjarne finds himself working at Bell Labs in the 1980s, he wants to create 
in his idea, he wants everything, right? He wants a language that has high-level constructs so that, like simula, he can write high-level simulations, but also has the kind of performance that he would expect from BCPL, or since he's now at, at Bell Labs, of course, he's going to be introduced to C, and that's going to be the language to use. So he ended up uh, creating something called C with classes, and eventually it became known, as we all know, as C++. Um, Jarni's been asked a question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of quote him, because I think it's, it, it provides real insight. C has its own baggage, right? C has declaration syntax that is interesting. And basing C++ on top of C meant embracing all that baggage. C++ has all the baggage that C has, it just inherits it, right? It has to, because it's being built. And so people have asked Bjarne and said, do you regret having based C++ on C? In other words, if you could have started from scratch, you could have had a much nicer syntax that would not have had the C baggage. But Bjarne's answer, I think, is really important, because what Bjarne said was, if I hadn't based C++ on C, I would have based it on something else. In other words, from Bjarni's point of view, yes, he's acknowledging there is a purity to starting from scratch and, and writing a syntax that doesn't have this baggage. But on the other hand, there's also a benefit from starting from something that's proven to be worthwhile. Right? So C has proven itself as the portable assembly language. Right? It was very, very valuable. It's used as systems programming. And so starting from that very valuable base and building on that proves that it, it is you know, proof that in C++, you can do portable assembly, because you can do anything you can do in C, and C does portable assembly. So then, during the 1980s, um, the number of C++ programmers doubled every seven and a half months. So it, it, uh, it was embraced, and it grew very fast. So right now, I'm going to kind of say, if you, I'm now going to get away from all the pretty pictures, and we're actually going to look at text. Um, but I'm not going to go into much depth on any of this stuff. If you really want to go into depth, read the book, because this is basically the first chapter of the book. It's why, why do people want to use C++? And we're just going to look at this at a very high level. And the first thing is, you get high-level abstractions at low cost. Right? So I'm not going to even read to you all these high-level abstractions. The point is that these are things that you don't get at the low level. These are things you don't get from a similar language. But they let you think about code at a much higher level. And we get these at a very low cost. Other languages, of course, you know, it's not like C++ is the only thing that does generic programming or it's the only thing that does object programming. programming. No. But the, the, the premise, because of Bjarni's original insight, because of the back of what happened to him when he was in college, was I want this high level performance, but I want to pay for it. So, um, I want to give you just one example, and that is that um, um, talking about user-defined types. In C++, the way we solve almost any problem is we look to a user-defined type. That's what we do. We create a type. Right? And so it's very, very important that the type system be something that allows you to do cool and interesting things, but at the same time doesn't have a lot of overhead to it. And so it is possible, for example, to create a fundamental arithmetic type. So imagine, for example, the um, complex numbers. Right? What are complex numbers? Those are numbers with both um, real and imaginary values. Right? And it would be fairly simple and straightforward to add that kind of um, numeric type to C++, but it was never done. Why? Because as a library type, the complex type has the kind of performance that we need. And it does allow for the kind of uh, mathematical symbols because we can do operator overloading to, to act like a built-in type. Um, we can do the same thing with uh, function pointers or object pointers. We can create these smart pointers where the performance is not quite as good as a built-in type, but very, very close. I mean, very little overhead, and yet having a lot more magic to what they can do. Um, we also have a number of different programming paradigms that are supported, but none of them are forced on us. If you don't want to use object-oriented programming, there's no requirement that you'd have to 
code around the fact that you don't want to use object oriented programming. If you don't want to use it, you don't use it. If you don't want to use generic programming, you don't do it. But if you want to use those paradigms that are available to you, and more importantly, or as importantly, not only the paradigms available to you, you can use them picking and choosing. You can combine them. You can, uh, the language isn't going to get in your way. It's not going to force a paradigm on you. It's not going to prevent you from using the paradigm. I think of C++ as a language for building libraries. It's really a library builder's language. Um, and it allows for library builders to make libraries that are very powerful, that are um, very efficient, but also, because of the ability to do operator overloading and things like that, be able to do a language syntax that makes sense for the particular library. Um, this kind of uh, power, again, is what you would expect of a language that combines high-level abstractions with low-level performance. Um, now, Bjarne has referred to what he calls the zero overhead principle. And what he's saying is there should be uh, zero abstraction penalty. We don't actually achieve that. Most, I should say most, many of the features that we do have um, do have some cost associated with them, but they're very, very low. And that drive toward the ideal of a zero overhead principle is a important idea for C++. On the standards committee, if you were considering a solution that would have C++ approach a problem, but allow for another language to be written that had higher performance, the people on the committee would say, then we haven't, we haven't done our job. You should be able to write in C++. It may not always be as easy as you'd like, but you'd be able to write as efficient as it can possibly be done in C++. You also get low level access when you need it. And this basically, there's not much to talk about here. You get all this from C. C++ is essentially a superset of C, and C is a high level portable uh, assembly language, and so you get all this stuff. Um, I do want to give one example about this low level access, and that is that most systems that support object-oriented programming have some kind of paradigm that works like this. We're going to ask for some memory, and then we're going to run some kind of function that constructs an object in that memory. Right? In C++, we'd call it a constructor, and we'd say, well, you call new, and you get a new chunk of memory, and you construct something in it. But other object-oriented programs have similar sorts of ways. Sometimes they even use new. But the idea is the same. We get a chunk of memory, and we create some object in it. But in C++, that's not good enough. It's a very convenient way to design a language. If you can assume that every object is allocated on the heap, it makes your language easier to implement. But it's not necessarily the best way for the user to have the language implement that way. And in C++, one of the options you can have is you can say, oh, I want to create an object and I want to construct it, but I don't want to put it from memory in the heap. I want to put it on the stack. Well, putting something on the stack is really limited. Right? You can't really control the lifetime of it. As soon as you leave the scope, that object's going to go away. So there's a great limit to it. But the trade-off is the performance of allocating something on the stack is dramatically better than allocating something on the heap. And in C++, you have your choice. And C++ even goes further then and says not only can you decide I want to create an object on the heap or I want to create an object on the, on the stack, in C++, you can create an object in any arbitrary piece of memory you want and control its lifetime, which is, of course, exactly what we do, for example, in, in Vector or any of the uh, standard objects. We create the object in place using in place new. And that's the kind of flexibility that you get with C++, because just being able to create objects on the heap would not be acceptable in C++. Um, there's also other kinds of things, for example, a lot of languages, they never really talk about things like cache performance or things like that, because you just can't control it in that language. The, the runtime of the language and the, uh, the, the way that language works prevents you from being able to have that kind of control. But in C++, we can control how memory is laid out. We can create data structures, for example. We can create arrays, vectors, and depths, things that take advantage of um, cache locality. 
We also now have a wide range of uh, applications. You know, in, in C++, well, I should say in software engineering in general, the question we're always asking about is scale. And generally, what we want to know is, will this approach scale? But sometimes we want to know the exact opposite question, which is, can I get the code that I want to run in a very, very small footprint? Or perhaps, can I get the code I want to run in very, very little memory or, or uh, with a very low power processor or on very little energy? And so at both the low end and the high end, we're really, really concerned about um, performance and not paying for what we don't use, which is a, a fundamental idea with C++. And that's one of the reasons why we can use C++ in really low-end applications. Again, portability comes from uh, the C machine model being a very easy to implement model. And so it turns out that the C machine model is often the target of hardware manufacturers. And the target manufacturers know that, that performance applications are written in C, and so the hardware manufacturer tries to support the C model. And that makes it easy to port C++ applications to all sorts of different platforms. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resource management because there's an important um, issue here. Um, I don't know in this light if you can see, but I have a lot of gray hair. Most of the gray hair I have is because I've chased down memory leaks or double disposes or something like that. These issues are serious issues. And uh, using garbage collection is a way of dealing with some really, really serious issues, really bad issues. But garbage collection, and, and garbage collection does allow us to get rid of leaks and double disposes and some really awful problems. But garbage collection is just a solution. And as engineers, we know that every solution has its trade-offs. Right? And so what are the trade-offs we have with garbage collection? Well, one of them is that we don't control when memory is released. Now, of course, there's different garbage collectors and there's different things, so this is a generalization, but, but some garbage collectors don't actually guarantee that memory is going to be released at all. Uh, it may be that it's going to be released at some arbitrary time, and that may have the side effect that your application, when garbage collection happens, when reclamation happens, you may experience freezing in your user interface because the background thread is doing garbage collection. So that's not really the kind of solution that we would want for C++. So one of the things that we would expect for C++ solution is that it would generalize. Memory is not the only resource in the, in the system, and managing memory is only one problem. We really want to manage all the resources in the system. We may have mutexes, we may have file locks, we may have database locks, we may have all sorts of resources from the operating system, and we have to manage them all. Now, in general, one of the things about memory that's very nice is that we don't really care when it's reclaimed as long as it's reclaimed before we need it. But that's not true necessarily of these other resources. For example, if we have a file lock and we have finished using this file, we want to reclaim that file lock as quickly as possible, as soon as we aren't using it, because some other application may want to open that file. And the same thing is true of any number of other resources. So one of the things that we want is to have resources reclaimed as soon as they're reclaimed, as soon as we don't need them anymore. And so we, in C++, we look at a feature of the language called deterministic destruction, which allows us to do something called RAII, which some people think means resource acquisition as initialization. Other people know it actually means responsibility acquisition as initialization, but we won't go into that now. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is that every responsibility that you acquire, you need to discharge, and the way you discharge it is by creating an RAI object which discharges that responsibility when that object goes out of scope. And that is a, a system for managing resources that, that works for not just memory, it's more general than memory, it allows you to handle any kind of system resource, and it frees up the resources immediately, as soon as they're recoverable, I should say, as soon as they are freeable. Um, and finally, one of the things I want to talk about is, um, is finally, which is a keyword that we find in other languages. We don't find that in C++. And that's because finally violates DRY. What is DRY? 
What's that? Don't repeat yourself. What's that? <laughs> I've gotten as high as five. Two and a half is pretty good. Um, right, right. Don't repeat yourself. So, so if I have a resource that, in order, to, whenever I use this resource, I need to modify the finally block to clean up the code because I've used this resource. That's a maintenance nightmare. That means every time I use that resource, I have to add a finally block on that block of code. Eventually. I'm going to forget, right? Or maybe because of maintenance, it's going to get deleted or not put in or something like that. Right? Um, if I'm going to have code that always has to be run in order to release the resource, let's tie that code to the resource, which is what C++ does with its destructors and deterministic destruction. So that's why uh, RAII is a better C++ solution than would be, for example, garbage collection. So I want to talk about the 1990s. We talked about how in, C++, in the 1980s, uh, the popularity of C++ was doubling about every seven months. But something happened in the 1990s that did, had even greater impact on C++. And that was object-oriented programming became the thing in the 1990s. The hype wave was in full, uh, full mode. You're going to detect a certain amount of sarcasm on my part. I'm not a huge fan of object-oriented programming. I will say that object-oriented programming is a great way to implement GUIs, and it turned out that the 1990s was an exciting time for implementing GUIs. So, uh, so it was an exciting time for C++. In fact, C++ became so important that a group of people uh, prevailed on Bjarne Struistrup and said, you know, this language is too important to be owned by one person. We need to make a standard out of this. And so the, there was a standard committee, International Organization for Standardization, an international treaty organization, that set up something called Working Group 21, which is the, uh, which is the standardization body for C++. And um, Johnny was actively supporting this, and he still has been working with the standards group to further evolve C++. Uh, but this was a time when things were very excited because everybody was everything was about object-oriented programming, and C++ was the uh, golden child for object-oriented programming. But it turns out not everybody was thinking about object-oriented programming. There was this guy, his name's Alex Stepanoff, and he was working on something called generic programming, which was a term that he created. And his interest was, is it possible to, to write algorithms so that there's a single implementation of this algorithm. You write sort just once. You write find just once. And you don't need to keep writing it over and over. Because we've written it already. And we use it as a building block. And so he created a library based on these ideas. And he was approached by this guy, Andrew Koenig. Andrew Koenig was the guy in charge of the library subcommittee of the standardization. And he, they both worked at Bell Labs, and so he sent Alex an email, and he said, are you going to submit your library to the standards committee? And Alex said, well, standards committee is pretty far along in their work. They're going to want to release a standard. They're not going to want to accept a big proposal like my library would be. Also, this library is unlike any library out there. They're not going to understand it. And so, they're not going to embrace it. And Andrew wrote back and said, you're absolutely right. The committee will not approve your library if you don't submit it. <laughs> <laughs> so Alex worked with a number of other people to make a formal proposal called the Standard Template Library. And um, his prediction was absolutely right. The Standards Committee looked at this and said, this is a monumental proposal. It doesn't look like anything in existence. There is no possible, wow, this looks pretty good. <laughs> so because they were trying to get the, the standard out the door, they trimmed it a bit. They didn't take his hash containers, and they made a few other changes. But essentially, having looked at the library and understood the library, they recognized that they didn't want to, they didn't want to think about a standard C++ that didn't have that library as part of it. 
and so they did accept it. And I, I want to say something here, because looking back now, 2015, and looking at the STL where we just accepted it, I don't know that I can communicate to you just how revolutionary this library was. I was programming C++ before I ever heard of the STL, before it was ever submitted to the Standards Committee. And I had used a number of different container libraries. And when I heard that a particular container library had been approved, remember the standard hadn't been approved yet, but this was accepted into the standard. I was very excited because this was a period of time where I was actually a software contractor. So I'd work on a project for a while, then I'd go to another project, then I'd go to another project, and every time I had to relearn their container library. So I thought, wow, if there was one container library, I could learn to use that, and I would just use that everywhere. And so I was really excited about it. And I started looking at it. And it was like, wait a minute, you put objects in the container that don't derive from object? Or they don't arrive from containable? What is this? <laughs> you guys understand this now. You're used to it. But at that time, this was a completely radical way of thinking about container objects. I was living in this object-oriented world. I understood objects. I understood you know, base classes. And that's how we worked with things, is by working with their base class. And here was this container library. Well, fortunately, it was all in the source. So I could understand it very easily by just looking at the header files. You guys never looked at the STL header files? Come on. I wasn't going to understand anything by looking at the header files. <laughs> so uh, my point is just that I have a great deal of respect for the Standards Committee because they looked at the library, and even though it was just as alien and foreign to them as it was to me, unlike me, they didn't say, what is this nonsense? They said, oh, this is good nonsense. We need to have this as part of the library. So, um, so the standard, the STL became part of the standard library. And it is uh, an amazing intellectual achievement, and it is something that is available to all C++ programmers. And not just the library itself, but the, but the ideas behind it, the generic programming approach to how to solve problems and how to extend the library is absolutely amazing. So by the time the library, the, the standard was actually released, which was in 1998, Andrew Koenig was no longer in charge of the library subcommittee. This man was. This man is Beeman Dobbs. And when he saw that the standard was, was released, he recognized that the library subcommittee in particular were going to have a problem. What was the problem? Well, the problem was that the mandate for the standards committee is not to do what they did with the STL. It's not to find some great library and make it part of the standard. That's what they did, and they have done those kinds of things. But the real mandate is to standardize existing practice. So what the committee is supposed to do is they're supposed to look at the libraries that are in widespread use and figure out how to standardize those. The problem with that is that libraries in existing use at the time were all commercial libraries. They were not good candidates for standardization. There wasn't what we see now with lots of open source and people sharing libraries broadly. At that time, the only libraries that were shared were proprietary libraries. And Beeman said, this is going to be a problem for us going forward in the library group, because there's no libraries for us to standardize. And it is not our job to try to write libraries. And that's, that's true. So what do they do? Well, um, Beeman worked with Dave Abrahams and some other people on the Standards Committee to create something called Boost. And the idea with Boost was that they wanted to create something where libraries could be freely shared. And that's what Boost is. It is a collection of open source libraries, but very, very importantly, peer-reviewed open source libraries. It's not a dumping ground for, oh yeah, we used this library in this one project, doesn't really work too well, it certainly doesn't work on Windows, uh, but we want to just dump it in you and you guys become, no, it's not that way, right? Boost has a peer review process. You submit a library, and this can be a, a fairly painful process because there's some give and take and there's some discussion, and, but the result has been what you kind of have to say by any standards is an amazing success. There's now about 150 libraries in the Boost collection, and almost every changed to the standard library since 1998, since the boost was collected, 
has either come from Boost or been really heavily influenced by Boost. You have to recognize that this has been an amazing achievement. So we, here we have um, incredible growth going from the 80s to the 90s with object-oriented programming exploding, standardization of the library, which is in 1998, or it's not the library, but the entire language is now an ISO standard in C++ in 1998, and we have the Boost libraries to give an additional uh, uh, opportunity for people to share. So we would expect that by 1998, C++ is poised to explode, right? The 2000s is going to be an amazing decade for C++, except it's not. What happens? Oh yeah, that. <laughs> so along comes Java. So what's Java? Well, you know, it, it supports OOP, right? So C++ is not the only object-oriented language out there. Um, it's also the language of the web. I don't really know what that means. What does that mean? Oh, it means it's the language of the future, right? So C++ is the language of C and lots of history and lots of baggage. Java is a rewrite. It's clean. It's exciting. It's all about the future. And, you know, it's almost as fast, right? And it's uh, easier to learn and to teach. So the 2000s was not so good for C++, but it was really good for Java. So let's talk about this. Um, almost as fast. The 2000s were, we had these desktop computers that were so powerful that we had to have operating systems on them that would use gratuitous animations just to make them, uh, just to be able to sell the computers, right? Because they were just so powerful. These are really powerful Intel chips that could just eat any problem. I mean, there's a limit to how fast you can recalculate your spreadsheet, right? And, you know, when you're talking about word processing, there's a point at which more power just doesn't really help, right? So why would you want to program in an environment like that? Why would you want to program in C++? There's this baggage, there's this complexity, you have these things called templates, you have generic programming. Nobody's figured that out except, you know, Alex and a bunch of guys at Boost. Um, then you have operator overloads, and that's just asking for syntax nightmares, right? And then you have pointers. You know, pointers. <laughs> I mean, pointers, really, right? Um, so why would you go to all the trouble when you have this managed language that is fast enough and doesn't have all these things? So we have, uh, we actually had a couple of different flavors of virtual machines. There was the Java family, there's Microsoft's family, and a lot of colleges would pick one and say, okay, well, you know, Microsoft's giving us all the software, we'll, we'll teach the Microsoft development system, or some of them would say, no, 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 we're gonna go down the Java path, but, but people who had been teaching C and or C++ decided, no, no, we're gonna teach Java, or we're gonna teach C Sharp. Did I mention that pointers are hard, right? You know, if we teach Java instead of C++, we can skip the whole chapter on pointers. <laughs> all right. So something else happened. Remember we talked about the standards committee. When did the standard get released? 98. 98. And what happened to the standards committee when the standard was released? Dissolved. It didn't dissolve, it just got small. Why did it get small? Well, there was a, a wide recognition in 1998 that it would be years, multiple years, before the standard would ever be completely implemented. There were things in the standard that had maybe been implemented on an experimental basis, or maybe some of the libraries had been implemented some places, but before anybody could ship a compiler that came close to implementing the standard would literally be years. So let's imagine you're on the standards committee, and you just released the standard. And you know that it's probably going to be five years before people can actually use the standard you just released. How excited are you about trying to work on the next standard? Right? You don't even have feedback yet on the existing standard. How can you be smart enough to figure out what people are going to want seven or eight years from now when we haven't even gotten feedback from what you're going to give them that they won't have for five years? And so what happened is, after the standards committee, uh, after the standard was released, the standard committee itself started to shrink. And they went into kind of bug fix mode. 
people would, you know, the standard was whatever it was, 650 pages long, there were a lot of things that were hard to understand, so people would uh, write in and say, can you clarify this, or can we fix this language? And so, for a long time, they weren't trying to release a new standard, because they knew it was gonna be so long before there was a standard release. Java was on a roll. Schools were not teaching C++ anymore, they were teaching Java. Um, Java was considered fast enough. People were doing development in Java or C Sharp. And so um, it looked like C++ was destined to be the new COBOL. It was going to be the language that was going to be used on legacy projects. Nobody was going to be interested in doing C++ anymore. C++ was ready for bed. Except that it wasn't. In 2010, C++ started to roar back, and that's what this talk is about, and that's what this book is about, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Why did C++ roar back? Well, it turns out performance matters. Remember when we talked about these desktop machines that had such powerful Intel processors in them that you really couldn't worry about performance on these machines? It turns out nobody cares about desktop machines anymore. Yeah, yeah, we're all programmers, and we, <coughs> we think desktop machines are really powerful, and I'm all for that. But that's not what people use for computers anymore. What do people use for computers now, right? It's this thing here, right? This is the new computer. And what about that thing? Well, the thing is, it runs on battery. How long does that battery last? Well, the battery lasts until the software you run on it drains the battery. And how fast the software drains the battery is a function of how efficient that software is. It turns out that performance matters. That's not the only place, though, that we do computing, right? Because there are some jobs that you just can't run on here. One of the most important things that you do on this little phone is you figure out how to get from place to place. It does mapping, right? Is there enough computing power in this machine to do mapping? No. Where does the mapping happen? The mapping happens here, right? So this is the other place we're concerned about computing today. Again, it's not on the desktop, it's in some cloud somewhere, right? Now, what are we concerned about here? Are we concerned about the battery? Well, if there's a battery in that thing, it's not going to last very long, <laughs> right? It's not battery, but it's the same issue. It's power, right? It's power. And again, what is controlling the power? The control of the power is, yes, it's what you do, but it's also how efficiently you do it. You know, what is the language you're using? How efficient is that going to be? So there's a guy named James Hamilton. He, he works for Amazon, and he's interested, he works at AWS, he's interested, and so he did this study on the costs of modern high-scale data centers. What I'm about to tell you, remember, doesn't apply generally to all computing, but to modern high-scale data centers. And what he did was he found out, and this is in decreasing cost, the most expensive thing is the hardware itself, it's the server. The next most expensive thing is power distribution and cooling. Notice that's more expensive than the power. It costs more to get the power to the machine and to cool it down than it does to actually run the machine. Interesting. And then networking equipment and then other infrastructure. After all, it's a big data set. There's other things. Notice the top three are directly related to software performance. If you're running code in this modern, high-scale data center, and you can write your code 10% faster, the cost of the data center go down by 9%. It's almost dollar for dollar improvement. If you can get 1% faster, you get almost 1% in savings of cost. There's a huge, huge leverage on software performance. Where are the IT programmers and IT professionals? Where are they? Where are their costs here? Did he forget them? Programmers are so overpaid. How could you forget them? Right? Um, no, no. It's that, and again, this is why I'm saying this isn't general. If you're working in an environment where you need to do UI a lot or, or do prototypes a lot and do that kind of stuff, this is really important. But in a modern, high-scale data center, the cost of writing the software is insignificant compared to the cost of running the software. And so optimizing, optimizing for programmer time as opposed to machine efficiency is choosing the wrong thing to optimize. 
Again, not in every case, but in this case. So something else happened. A big driver for the interest in C++ was this technology, but something else happened. And that is ISO released C++ 11. So they released almost nothing of interest in the 2000s. There was a couple of releases that were kind of minor, not terribly interesting. But it wasn't because they were wasting their time. It's because they didn't manage to get something shipped. And the truth is that they did a lot of interesting stuff in the language in the 2000s, but they didn't get it shipped until 2011. In fact, uh, Bjarni says 2011 feels like a new language. And in a sense it is. It went from about 760, 770-some pages to almost twice that number of pages. You know, one of the challenges that the Standards Committee faces is that everybody looks at that number, 700 pages to define the language, and they all recognize C++ is just too complicated. But the challenge of the committee is you can't make it less complicated. We can't take anything out, because what would happen if we took something out? Right. No longer would you be able to recompile old stuff, right? And that's just not acceptable. Everything has to be backward compatible. We can never take anything out. So is it possible to simplify the language by adding to it? Well, that's kind of counterintuitive. Generally, if you add to something, you make it more complicated. That just is what you do. But not necessarily. And this is one of the things that the Standards Committee has done an excellent job of. Things like auto, range-based for loops, uh, a number of things where the Standards Committee has worked to make the language simpler by adding new rules that in some cases are more general, or in some cases are simplifications. They also added a lot of things that you just expect of modern languages. Things like Unicode support, things like Lambdas, and a number of the libraries that had been in Boost now become part of the standard. There's also a few completely new ideas, like um, support for things um, in, uh, in library authorships, and then multi-threading, is that new? No, C++ has had multi-threading since, since multi-threading was in existence, but it wasn't part of the standard. So now in C++11 we introduced that in the standard. And then we also introduced something called move semantics, which I would love to talk to you about, but I'm not going to. Um, so it turns out this is, a, uh, this is a survey done on stack overflow of most loved languages. And it turns out that Swift is the most loved language. It's easy to love a language before you've used it. So, um, so Swift is the most loved language. But look at this, C++ 11, right? A language that, um, that has been in existence almost forever, and yet breathing new life into it with this new update, which has been very popular with programmers. There's something else that's kind of new. What is this guy? Clang. Clang, OK. Um, so Clang is a new compiler, right? And so this has introduced some competition. Uh, we certainly see that old compilers had room for improvement in terms of build performance and error messages. And if you don't think that, find yourself a compiler from the year 2010 and look at the error messages and compare them today. I'm not talking about Clang. I'm talking about other compilers and see the impact that Clang has had on other compilers. So that's why I'm saying it's about competition. Even if you have never used Clang, and even if for one reason or another your organization will never use Clang, you're still benefiting from the fact that Clang exists because of the competitive pressure that it puts on whatever tool you're using. But the real import of Clang is not this competition at all. The real import of Clang is that it is designed from the very beginning not to be a compiler, but to be a toolkit. It is a set of, of tools that you can put together to make a compiler. That's great. But you can also make sanitizers, or you could also add features. There's all sorts of different kinds of tools we can make. And the long-term impact on C++ of Clang, I think, is going to be here and not here. Yes, it's going to make other compilers better, but it's actually going to make tools that we're going to find that are going to make all of our lives much, much better. There's something else that's been going on, and that is this uh, success of open source has been really, really good for C++. Because it turns out that compilers can do better optimizations when they see source than when they see object code that just needs to be linked together. And so having libraries in open source is a benefit for C++. 
And it turns out we're not seeing a huge love, but we're seeing that there is an uptake in use of C++ and GitHub. And again, this is a very, very old language, and yet it is showing growth now. Regrowth, in some sense. We talked about what happened to the standards committee when the 98 standard was released. What happened? It shrank. What happened when the 11 was released? It grew. Why would it grow? Didn't we just figure out why when you release a standard, your committee grows? Why? Well, because it takes so long to actually implement that standard. But we were just talking about Clang. Clang, GCC, and even Microsoft is not doing as good a job at following the standard, is doing a better job now at following the standard than they were doing back in 1998. Back in 1998, we knew it would be five years before we had something that would be a standard or near standard compliant compiler. Whereas when C++11 came out, there were features already present in all of our compilers that were from C++11 because the, the developers had been following the development of the standards committee much better. And we had implementations that were, and I'm not going to split hairs and I'm not going to try to, to quantify exactly how close, but we had implementations that largely implemented C++11 in about a year after the standard was finished. An amazing achievement. And the, res the, the, the reality is not just, oh, as programmers, we enjoy that. The other reality <coughs> is that the standards committee has a completely different outlook on the world. If you're thinking about going to the standards committee meeting, you're thinking about working on the standard, you're thinking about helping out to define what the standard should be, and you realize, you know what? What we say is in the standard today, even before it gets pushed out to be part of the standard, just the fact that we voted into the standard means that real programmers may be using it in months or, or a year or two. That's an incredible incentive. So it's the exact opposite incentive in the 1998 committee, which was saying, if we made a change now, it's going to be a decade before anybody sees it. Now becomes, if we make a change now, it may be 10 months before people actually start using it in their tools. And that is a wonderful motivator to get involved in the standards committee. So the standard did something then. It paralyzed the work. They had so many people showing up at the standards committee that they said, well, let's start doing some focus. And they actually set up these SGs or study groups. So right now, there's 14 study groups, although I will say that some of these study groups have essentially finished their work for C++17 by releasing a technical specification. I'm not going to go into all that. But the point is that the committee grew. The committee became more active, not less active. And the output from the committee is truly astounding. Um, one of the things that we saw actually in, in 2010 Already, it was obvious that people were starting to become more and more interested in C++. So Herb Sutter worked with a number of companies to set up a nonprofit whose job it was to promote C++. And this sounds kind of weird, but understand there are languages like C Sharp or Java that are actually more or less owned by certain corporations, and they work hard to promote those languages. C++ has never had that relationship. Nobody has ever been in charge of promoting C++. There's a standards committee, but their job is to define C++, not promote it. And so this nonprofit organization was set up and actually created a website called isocpp.org. How many of you have gone to isocpp.org? You should go there at least once a week and see what's going on in the C++ world. Oh, I'm, I'm not kidding. If I was kidding, I would say go there every day. I go there every day. But, but you should go there. Any C++ program should go there at least once a week and see what's going on in the C++ world. Um, one of the new tools that's just been released just this year is, uh, is C-Line. It's a cross-platform IDE by JetBrains. Of course, JetBrains is the company that sponsored the book that we wrote. And, uh, but that's not why they're in the slide. In fact, they weren't in my, my slides at first. I put them in the slides because the marketing person for C-Line published some really interesting C++ facts. And these were the things that caused JetBrains to make C-Line was because they did some market research. And I'm going to share some of these things with you. Um, I asked Anastasia, who, who put this stuff together, uh, for permission. And what she said is, well, be sure you tell people <laughs> the source. Because this may be the very best information there is on the market of C++ users. But very best is relative. The actual problem with it is that this kind of data is just hard to know. 
And so she's saying, you know, let them know that we just basically pulled together a lot of things like uh, job ads, uh, GitHub files, Google Trends. So is this solid information that I'm about to present? No. It may be the best information that's out there. They built a product based on it. They believe it. I think it's probably true, but I'm not going to risk my life on it. So I'm going to caution you about all the information I'm about to present. The first thing was, this is a bit of a surprise to me. I've heard people say that there were probably about 3 million C++ users. But, um, but, but JetBrains believes there's four, almost 4.5 four million C++ developers. Um, it, I did believe that there were more C++ developers than Python developers. What kind of surprised me is there's not a lot more according to, uh, according to JetBrains' research. This surprised me a lot. That uh, for the one million developers in North America, there's almost half as many in Latin America, and there's 50% more in both Europe and Asia. That was a big surprise to me. Why? Why? I did not, I mean, the one million in North America wasn't a big surprise. But that there's that many more in Europe and Asia, and that many in Latin America, is actually a surprise to me. I, I don't think there was as big a push to change the curriculums in, uh, in schools that were not in the U.S. So is it, is it an education yeah. I think, uh, I think issue? It is it a market issue? Is it a type of applications? Maybe they need to the stop teaching C++ and teach Java. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's basically what happened. They, they didn't... Did everybody hear what these guys up here are saying? Sure. What they're saying is that basically in the 2000s, when an American university stopped teaching C++ in order to teach Java, that's not necessarily what other universities across the world did. Well, that's still something that has to be fixed. They're What's still, that? They're still teaching Java. Yes, they're still teaching Java. That's right. In this country. I'm surprised it's that low in Europe. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm surprised it's not higher. I agree. Well, it may be. <laughs> we don't really have really hard evidence, right? <laughs> this is this is their best guess. So are the I think it would be uh, more insightful to report not absolute numbers, but percentages. What percentage of, the, of professional programmers uh, use what language? Um, that might be interesting. That might be interesting, too. Uh, the problem, again, is we just By don't the, know these kinds the of things, right? Um, so one thing they said is uh, this is trying to get uh, trying to get at that, I think, is to say where are the areas that uh, where C++ is relatively more popular than other languages. Um, I'm not sure how to interpret this, really. But it is what you asked for. <laughs> right. uh, actually, I, I have some notion of why this is true. Okay, all right. And it's, it's related to the level of mathematical ed math education in high school. Could be. Okay. I, I've been there, so yeah, okay. I know this first time. I'm not, uh, I'm not disagreeing. Um, this was also a little bit of a surprise. I wasn't surprised at the industries that showed up here. What I was kind of surprised is how dominant the finance industry is. Um, I speak trading. <laughs> Microseconds matter. Yeah, except that I don't... <laughs> I, I'm a little surprised that it's that... I mean, yes, I know that that's a big... That's a big industry for this, but, but to think that there's that many more people doing the coding is a big surprise. But there is actually a very straightforward reason for that. And the reason for that is that C++ is currently the only uh, common use programming language that allow uh, time series to be expressed naturally with relative indexing. And we can take this offline, but been there, done that, so okay. that is the reason. Okay, very good. Um, so this I thought was kind of interesting. Again, these are the uh, skills that are advertised with C++. So if you're looking for a C++ employee, it turns out you probably want them to also do Java, but you don't necessarily care if they do Perl, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, this was a little bit of a surprise, maybe not a huge surprise, but um, that Linux is a very, very popular platform for C++ development. Um, 
And then um, the fact that one third of C++ users are using C++11, I thought was very, very uh, <coughs> exciting to me. That, that there is a great deal of penetration on C++11, given how some industries are not likely to, to adopt new stuff soon. So that kind of penetration looks very good to me. What does ANSI refer to? ANSI C. Or ANSI? I'm, I'm assuming it's ANSI C. It's I mean, they can't, I, can't be anything. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they've mixed, what because JetBrains, their product supports both C and C++, so they they mix their C information in here, too. Yeah. Uh, popular C++ compilers, I wouldn't say this was a huge, um, huge surprise there. Compilers on Windows. I think the fact that GCC is that popular on Windows is a bit of a surprise to me. Um, debuggers, haven't really given that much thought. Uh, build systems, and the reason they were just in build, debuggers and build systems is that's part of what JetBrains does, and so the combination is there. So the other thing, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is something called CPPCast. How many of you know about CPPCast? Not too many of you, right? Um, this is a podcast that talks about C++. Now, it is a little weird to think about a podcast which is entirely audio talking about programming language, right? So I've listened to it. It's actually a lot of fun to listen to, but it's all interviews, right? There's no discussion of code. We don't say, OK, the show notes have a bunch of slides that you can watch as you're driving along. No, it's, it's interviews, right? It's just interviews. But it's actually very interesting. Um, the, the, the guys that are doing this podcast have managed to get some of the very best speakers on C++ and interview them. Um, and I know that because I've helped them line those speakers up. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's lots of cool stuff going on on the web for C++. Those of you uh, who can read this, uh, fairly recently here, uh, Reddit's <coughs> CPP subreddit hit 30,000 subscribers just a few months ago. Um, there's lots of stuff going on in Stack Overflow. There's a really, really cool wiki called cppref.com that um, uh, don't get me started on that. I love the fact. Uh, and then there's this uh, cprogramming.com, which is a, a community of people who uh, are helping each other learn C and C++. There's also a number of different uh, events that are going on. All of these uh, conferences are new in the last five years. Uh, CppCon, which just happened, meeting C++, which is coming up in December. Going Native, which was uh, done a couple of years, but probably won't happen again. And then C++ Now, which is the new name for BoostCon, which has been going on for a number of years. Again, if you want to talk to me about any of these, I'm willing to talk your head off. Um, do you have any questions? Yeah. Oh. You talked about Java success for about a decade. Yeah. Do you see any other language coming up flaring like that? Or will C++ be the king almost? If um, not, why not? So the, the factors that have driven C++ success are the exact same factors that are causing people to look at alternatives, right? Because if people are looking for essentially systems programming capable languages that also support high level abstractions, then people are going to look at C++ and they're going to, some of them are going to say, wow, there's a lot of baggage there. It's not really that easy to understand that. So they're going to look at alternatives. Can you think of any? No. OK, Ollie can't think of any. You said it. Rust. Rust. Swift. Go. The language that cannot be named. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a cool new book. You know, when I was when I was up in uh, uh, when I was up in Bellevue, I saw some copies of this new book that come out on, on D, and I'd heard about this book before, but I'd never seen it before, and so it was kind of a thrill for me to see it. The local user group, the C++ user group out there, was giving away a couple of copies um, as prizes, so it was very cool. Yeah. So, uh, what is the name? What was? Do you know the name of that book? <laughs> <laughs> okay, John is referring to me. It's called Programming in D. It's freely available, just like the book you mentioned. Well, the difference is that yours is a real book, and it's quite thick. <laughs> Mine is not a real book. It's just a booklet. It's, it's 800 pages right now, yes. And it's freely available as PDF or HTML pages. 
And I heard actually Andre and Walter were in Romania uh -huh. recently. Uh -huh. They talked to a 400 uh, crowd of 400 packed audience sponsored uh, by Siemens in uh -huh. Romania. Uh -huh. And they talked about D to these non D programmers. Yeah. And I heard they gave my book, Andre's book, somebody else's book, all signed as. Uh, Sweet. You know, to the most embarrassing question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, but in answer to your question, taking it very seriously, yes, there are going to be alternatives, and the very factors that are driving people to look at C++ are going to drive people to look at alternatives. So the, the thing that makes C++, um, as, I, as I was saying, what's, what's what makes C++ special is the combination of high-level attributes with low-level performance. But special is not unique, right? There are other languages that are trying to do exactly the same things. What makes C++ unique is that combination of high-level performance, uh, or high-level abstractions, low-level performance, and wide industry adoption. And that's what a new language has to deal with, right? So the advantage of a new language is you can avoid the, apt the, the baggage. You can avoid the baggage of C, you can avoid the baggage of C++, but the problem is you don't have wide industry adoption. And that's what any new language is going to have to deal with, right? And so C++ has to figure out how do we stay relevant, right? How do we deal with this baggage by adding things that, that don't add complexity but instead add simplicity? That's a challenge. Um, but on the other hand, leverage the fact that we have you know, wide adoption of tools, we have a lot of interest and a lot of, you know, yeah. Um, yes? Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, because of uh, smaller devices like phones, uh, which are not as powerful as computer, there is more need for performance. But uh, I see mostly people who are the big, the two big uh, platforms are iOS and Android, uh -huh. and most of them work with their own languages and their own platforms. And unless it's graphics or uh, <coughs> or things like audio processing, video processing, most most of the work is not done in C++ or C. It's mostly in higher level languages like Objective C or Java. It's it's very true that if you want to write things that look good on those platforms, the developers of the platforms are pushing their own <coughs> languages, right? But it's also true that there's there is a high level language, only one, that is available on iOS and Android and Windows Mobile and Blackberry, right? And that's C plus plus. So if you want to write a portion of your code that isn't dependent on the UI and isn't dependent, you know, it's the it's the business rules of your application, you can write that as C++ and you can test that on one platform and you can roll that out to all your platforms, right? And then you do your user interface in whatever the uh, platform provider, you know, whatever they want you to use because they're going to have great <coughs> right? So, um, I'm not seeing. I'm not saying that C++ is dominant in this field. It's not, but it has an important role. And there's lots and lots of companies, including some big companies like Dropbox and people like that, who are exploiting this strategy. Where they're saying we want to write C++ and roll it out on as many different platforms as we can, and then we will also have a team that's an expert in that particular platform to to handle the platform specifics. Right. So. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's driving interest in C++, but it's not, this isn't an area where C++ is dominant. There's lots of areas where C++ is dominant, this is not one. Okay. Did you have a question? So to follow up on that, there are, I, I use two mapping applications on my Android phone. Google Maps is written in Java, and it does all of its routing in the cloud. Uh -huh. There's another application that has its database locally and does its, da does its routing on the system. Oh, really? Uh -huh. And their routing engine is written in C++. Sweet. Well, I suspect that the Google Maps routing engine is also written in C++. It's just not running. Really likely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, other questions or comments? Yeah, Bryce. Um, the issue still exists that students in in undergrad CS students don't get exposure to C++. Uh -huh. These days, it's much more Python than Java, or it's 
a lot of schools have, are switching away from Java, yeah. but they're switching to Python. Yeah. And I, I did, uh, ISO CPP has done a lot for community outreach, but I don't think um, any substantial efforts have been made to so, get schools to expose students to C++. So there's, so this, this is one of those, you know, there's, there's the good side and the bad side, right? So uh, the bad news is that um, American CS professors are not teaching students how to program C++. The good side is that American <laughs> CS professors are not teaching students C++. Um, if, you, if you talk to a student that has graduated and, and they did take C++, it's very likely their concepts of C++ are very poor. So what's the solution? The solution is that people need to go to places like CPPCon and but, but the learn issue, there. They need to watch the videos. They need to hire people like me to come to their but the issue is, businesses. Uh, the issue is, is that, and I hear this a lot from people, is that it's difficult to get entry-level people for the need to, to, if you need to hire an entry-level person to work on the C++ code base, yeah. it becomes really difficult. You almost always have to train them in-house. Yeah, so but, the, but, the, but I would argue also that it's not easy to find entry-level Java people either. I mean, we are in a... We are in a situation where it's a seller's market for developers, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about. It does matter a little bit. That there's there's differences between the different languages, but but all the languages share something, which is that you. I, it's I, hard to hire. I, in I any hazard of them. guess that it's that if I need a Python developer, it's probably easier for me to to find somebody fresh out of undergrad than to find somebody who's got specific C++ expertise. Yeah, I I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree. With that. Yeah. I just moved from India, and I see similar trend over there. Uh, yes, I graduated around 2007, and that time C++ was another language taught, but nowadays it's mostly Java. And what I see the side effect of that is that people coming out of college, they have less interest towards C++. I don't say that, okay, uh, they will have good skills when they learn it, but when they actually graduate it, they, have, they should have, uh, they have very less interest towards C++. They want Java or Python because they think that's the thing tomorrow, and that's the thing. And that, if they have multiple offers, they will turn down the offer which, has, which is a C++ job. And that is one of the problems that I see that going forward it might be, though you said that the Asia, at least Asia, it might decline the usage of C++ might be because of these things where people are not interested more in C++ but they are interested in Java or Python. That is one of the problems that I see. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to end up like Fortran where it, or COBOL where it's Cobol. literally impossible to find. Uh, yeah, over here. Mm -hmm. you know, just a follow up to that earlier point, uh, one anecdotal data point. A coworker of mine graduated UC Davis 2013, and I show him C++, you know, uh, 2011 stuff, uh -huh. or C++ 11 stuff, and you know his comment is, is wow, that you know that it doesn't look anything like the C++ they, they taught us, and I really think it's a fundamental <coughs> issue with the lack of knowledge of the professors. They're they're teaching you know C with classes. Is really what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's, procedure, it's procedural C, and they're throwing in, you know, the oddly written class here and there. Yeah. If I was, C++. you know, if I was going to get on my soapbox and make a speech, I guess I am. <laughs> uh, I think, I think there's, I think there's a fundamental problem, and I don't have an easy solution. I wish I did. I would push the button and I would implement the solution. But there's a problem in that most, most kids, if I can say that without being disparaging, but but students are in CS curriculums, but they're not becoming computer scientists. They're becoming software engineers, and they're completely not being prepared for that. Right. Right. I mean, it's it's not like they can't do that job with a certain amount of industry experience would get them. But the real, if you were, if there was a solution, whatever that was, is to get universities to decide that software engineering is an important thing to teach, and universities don't have that. They don't believe that. And even if they did, then you have to get students to decide that software engineering is what they want to study. And I don't think students appreciate that. And so we're in this situation where we have an industry that has a crying need for really good software engineers, and there's nobody creating software engineers. Rebuttal. Okay. Rebuttal. Rebuttal. Okay. Rebuttal. Uh, university offers a master's in software engineering. I've looked at taking it. Uh -huh. uh, my problem with it is that it is not rigorous enough on the computer science side. They do not require algorithms, for example. The flip side of that is, I agree with you, they're teaching people computer science, 
because that's what people are hiring for. Yes, yes. Right? We've all seen the articles complaining about interviews where all they do is ask algorithm <coughs> question after algorithm <coughs> question. Right, right. They're looking for sui generis candidates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, and one of the interesting things I've found is, because I was actually part of a, I was teaching software engineering at the graduate level, is it surprised me, but there's more graduate programs in software engineering, and I can't say this is true now, but at the time, there were more graduate programs in software engineering than there were undergraduate programs. That makes perfect sense, right? It, it's, you know, in a sense it does, yeah. Teaching engineering requires a certain maturity uh, yeah, but we managed to teach it's all, it's chemical engineers to chemical engineering to sophomores. It's also frequently easier to create a master's program that for in software engineering that's in a school of engineering than to create an entire undergraduate Correct. curriculum. Right, right. Um, that's a yes. much more substantial process, which requires so uh, Ansel. So uh, sort of a concurrence to the rebuttal. The other problem is that people disagree about what software engineering means. Oh, no, it means whatever I say. I mean, <laughs> no, there's no reason to disagree. In my university, <laughs> do, you, do you agree with John or are you wrong? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> at my university, if you were a software engineer, you were not expected to write code at all in your subsequent career. You were expected to be the team lead for a software engineering group. Oh, my. So like be aware that the definitions may vary. But the other thing I was going to ask is, do you have any idea of the current state of C and C++ being taught in undergrad curriculums? Because I know when I was at uh, university, um, they had <coughs> been teaching in C for some time. They took a two-year experiment in Java and then decided it was a bad experiment and went back to C, leaving a wake of very confused third-year students. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember when I had the slide with uh, Fortran and there was that really, really funny uh, piece of paper that had the columns on it, right? When I was in university, <laughs> that's what we used, right? Um, so asking me what the current state of universities is, uh, is not going to be a fruitful thing. So yeah, the answer is no, I don't know. As, as, as somebody from the public sector and also having recent-ish exposure to, um, to schools, um, I think it's roughly what somebody else said. It's still all C with classes. Um, I mean, to some degree, it, it, a part of the problem is that a lot of PhDs um, end up in private sector. No, but you, what, what, you're saying when they do teach C++, yes. it's C with classes. Yes. I think yeah. what he was saying is, are they teaching C++ at all? Are they even yeah. pretending to teach C++? So, as a, some classes. as a data point, I just interviewed a student for an internship, a freshman, and I asked them, what are you studying? He's starting CS, and they're doing C++, and they're starting with the STL. Yeah, so, it's yeah, what, what slide, finally. <laughs> what, what school is that? Uh, what <laughs> school is that that was RPI? Yeah. There's, I think, some school. All right, so uh, I'm, I'm willing to answer questions, uh, but we, but we want to go to uh, Tide House and answer questions while eating. So that's even better. But, uh, but some of you aren't going to go to Tide House, so let's, I'll take a couple more questions. Otherwise, if you're coming to Tide House, don't ask a question, you'll ask it later. Did you want to, Embry? I just, I was thinking maybe one of the things we can, people can do um, in terms of promoting C++ is, say, for example, uh, in, in, in mobile device environment, like, for example, uh, if we have more libraries that we can, uh, uh, promote as far as platform, for example, instead of using core data, we use MySQL directly. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be, there might be more interest in doing that because it's just a great um, use because you can use it in both Android and right. and iOS and Mac and you know, Linux. So it just covers a lot. But people keep going to, oh, let's just do core data because the interfaces are so much easier. Right, right. Well, you know, as long as people are willing to, to tie themselves to a particular platform, and that's a trade-off. I mean, I'm not saying it's always the wrong trade-off, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off. And if you're, you know, there's a bigger question about time to market versus maintainability and portability. And the companies that are going to focus on time to market are not going to embrace C++ because it's, that's not going to be worth it. Any other questions before we head off to uh, Tide House? Does everybody know where Tide House is? Yeah. The way forward is obvious. As yes. in, in C++ 11, we got another true and complete language. Yes. 
we should just keep adding more. Adding more to <laughs> the mushrooms, right. Because um, that's how you get simplicity. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the question is, what transitive language can we add to C++? Concepts. Okay. All right. So I want to thank you guys all very much. As I said, I've got some books up here. If you want to